Welcome back to Generals and Napoleon. Episode 14, Marshal Grouchy. There's an old saying that goes, quote, There's no such thing as bad publicity, end quote. The logic being, at least you are mentioned in a story, even if your name is cast in a negative light. But rarely do you receive so much flack for following orders, doing your duty, and winning a battle. So Marshal Grouchy might dispute that old saying about publicity. For over 200 years, the Marshal and his defenders had been trying to explain his actions during Napoleon's final battle at Waterloo. The day after Napoleon's loss, the Marshal was preparing to pursue the Prussians, who he had driven from the town of Wavre. When he heard of the catastrophe at Waterloo, the Marshal immediately stopped the pursuit and by a crafty retreat, brought his troops back to Paris before the enemy arrived at the gates. But instead of the thanks he expected to receive, he found himself saddled with the blame for the loss at Waterloo. But we will get into those details towards the end of our story. Emmanuel Grouchy was born in Paris on October 23, 1766. He was the son of Francois Jacques de Grouchy, an aristocrat, and his wife, Gilbert. In 1779, the young Grouchy entered the French artillery, but transferred to cavalry three years later. By 1784, he was a captain in the cavalry. A year later, he married Cécile Le Doulet, who was the daughter of a French general of the Royal Army. The couple would go on to have four children. Grouchy was forcibly retired from the army due to health reasons in 1787. But when the French Revolution rolled around, he re-entered the service in 1791. Grouchy was a soldier through and through and stated, quote, Though I am not permitted to fight at the head of the Republican phalanxes, they cannot prevent me from shedding my blood in the cause of the people. End quote. He quickly was promoted to colonel and performed well in the battles in the Vendée region. But suspicions of his noble birth and possible royal allegiances forced him again into retirement in 1793. If you're noticing a pattern of Grouchy having to prove himself and defend his record, you aren't wrong. He would unfortunately have to do this all throughout his life. Like all of Napoleon's marshals, his bravery on the field was never in question. Grouchy received 23 wounds during his career, ranking him second behind Marshal Oudinot. In 1794, he was reinstated into the army as general of division, the highest rank at that time. In 1796, he was second in command on the ill-fated French seaborne invasion of Ireland. Hoping to stir up anti-British sentiments on the Emerald Isle, the French invasion of 15,000 troops never made it ashore. After two weeks of battling stormy weather and losing 2,000 sailors and soldiers to drowning and disease, the invasion was called off. The commander, General Hoche, and the admiral of the French fleet lost heart due to poor weather and returned to France. Once back in France, Grouchy was assigned to the French army in Italy. He quickly conquered the Piedmont territory in northern Italy. Grouchy also negotiated the abdication of the king of Sardinia, resulting in a windfall gain of land, fortresses, and treasures for France. On August 15, 1799, Grouchy was a commander in General Joubert and General Moreau's battle against the powerful Russian General Suvorov. Although Grouchy's troops performed well, capturing 2,000 prisoners, the French army was routed by the Russians and Austrians. General Joubert was shot through the heart at the beginning of the battle and killed instantly. 
During the retreat, Gurushi suffered 14 injuries, including four saber cuts and a bullet wound, and was captured by the Russians. His health was slowly restored over four months by the surgeon of Russian Grand Duke Constantine. During this time, he unwisely wrote a letter protesting Napoleon's coup d'etat, which would be noted upon his eventual return to France. His release from captivity was secured after Napoleon's victory at Marengo in 1800. He was quickly back on the front lines, serving under General Moreau. On December 3rd, he fought in the Battle of Hohenlinden, where he and future Marshal Ney performed wonders in a blinding snowstorm. Grouchy's division drove back the main column of attacking Austrians and turned the battle into a crushing rout. The French suffered only 3,000 casualties, while the Austrians suffered 13,550 dead, wounded, or captured. The dominant victory enabled Moreau to become a possible rival to Napoleon, and thus the First Council was suspicious of Grouchy's loyalty. In 1801, Grouchy was appointed to Inspector General of the Cavalry, a job he truly loved. In the 1805 Ulm campaign, Grouchy commanded an infantry division under General Marmont. In the campaign against Prussia a year later, Murat, Grouchy, and the cavalry produced wonders in chasing and capturing large bodies of enemy troops. In the October 1806 Battle of Prenzlau, Grouchy and Murat bluffed 10,000 Prussian troops into surrender after a short skirmish. The cavalry actions of Napoleon's troops in the war against Prussia have been called, quote, the greatest sustained pursuit in history, end quote. In 1807, Grouchy distinguished himself further in the bloody Battle of Eilau against the Russians and Prussians. During the battle, Marshal Augereau launched an attack against the Russians at Napoleon's order. As his corps was marching towards the enemy lines, a blinding snowstorm caused his attack to drift off course, and his soldiers were caught in the crossfire of cannon. One French officer remarked, quote, 300 cannon on either side, pouring out a hail of grape shot at close quarters, wreaking terrible havoc, end quote. As Napoleon's lines wavered, Marshal Murat launched an epic 10,000-man cavalry charge that saved the army. As usual, Grouchy was in the middle of the fray and had his horse shot out from under him. The general's leg was broken, and he was only saved by one of his aides, but he calmly remounted another horse and resumed command of his dragoons. He again led his division forward into the blinding snow. The efforts of Murat and Grouchy were nothing short of stellar in this inconclusive battle, which resulted in 25,000 casualties on each side. A few months later, Grouchy would again provide good service at the Battle of Friedland. As the Russians were retreating, the pursuing French forces became strung out. The vanguard corps of Marshal Lan caught up to Russian General Benningsen in June of 1807. Lan's corps was only 26,000 strong, but he and Grouchy kept the 50,000 Russians in check through 16 hours of fighting until Napoleon arrived. Once Napoleon brought more forces into the melee, it turned into a rout as 80,000 Grand Army troops pushed 50,000 Russian troops through Friedland and over a river. Grouchy's repeated cavalry charges were documented by a soldier who remarked, quote, Dragoons, lancers, and hussars flowed into the fight like a torrent the sun catching steel breastplates and sabers, and the entire plain echoing with the thunder of hooves and the steady roar of Vive l'Empereur, quote. As this onslaught continued, 
the Russians retreated frantically over the river. Grouchy has been criticized by some historians for not launching a vigorous cavalry pursuit of the fleeing Russian army. But Napoleon himself thought Grouchy rendered good service and awarded him with the Legion of Honor after the battle. In 1808, Napoleon dispatched him to Spain to assist Marshal Murat in Madrid. Grouchy was named governor of Madrid on May 2, 1808. Unfortunately, one of his first tasks was to put down a violent three-hour uprising by the citizens of Madrid, who did not like foreign rulers. 150 French troops were killed, and 200 Spanish citizens were killed in the violence. Another 300 Spanish were executed for taking part in the revolt. In a statement by Marshal Murat, quote, The population of Madrid, led astray, has given itself to revolt and murder. French blood has flowed. It demands vengeance. All those arrested in the uprising, arms in hand, will be shot. End quote. Want to make a podcast? Spotify has got a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere, and even earn money. All one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters, and here's how it works. Spotify for Podcasters lets you record and edit podcasts right from your phone or computer. So no matter what your setup is like, you can start creating today. Then you can distribute your podcast to Spotify and everywhere else podcasts are heard. Video podcasts are also available. With Spotify for Podcasters, you can earn money in a variety of ways, including ads and podcast subscriptions. And best of all, it's totally free with no catch. Ever since I discovered Spotify for Podcasters, I've really enjoyed the ease of use and the distribution ability of this platform. Following this stressful time, Grouchy requested a leave of absence for health reasons. After recuperating, he was made Count of the Empire in 1809 and reassigned to Italy to support Prince Eugene there. Napoleon's stepson was battling a resurgent Austria in Italy. Grouchy performed well in the battles of Piave River and Rab. He also assisted Eugene and Napoleon at the hard-fought Battle of Ragram in July of 1809. Towards the end of 1809, his fragile health began to fail him again, and he was put on the semi-retired list back in France. I use the word semi-retired because Napoleon always needed capable generals to lead his troops, and so Grouchy was recalled in 1812 for the monumental invasion of Russia. He again led brilliant cavalry charges at the battles of Smolensk and Borodino. In the latter battle, he was injured in the chest by case shot and had a horse killed out from under him. His son was serving alongside him in the battle and was also wounded. Both recovered sufficiently to protect the emperor during the retreat from Moscow. In 1813, he was again put on the semi-retired list of officers to restore his health, but he was back in the saddle in 1814, rendering superb defensive services as the Allies invaded France. Grouchy performed exceptionally well at the Battle of Vauchamp in February, where Napoleon notched another victory. But it was too little, too late for the emperor, and he abdicated his throne in April of 1814. When King Louis XVIII took over the throne, Grouchy lost his coveted position of Colonel General of the Chasseurs à Cheval, which was very disappointing to him. He was replaced by the Duke of Berry, and Grouchy remained mostly at his estates. When Napoleon returned from Elba, Grouchy rallied to his cause. In April of 1815, the last baton from Napoleon was awarded to Grouchy. The original ranks of the 25 marshals had thinned out. Lan, Ponitowski, and Bessier were dead. 
Berthier was soon to be from suicide. Bernadotte was becoming a king in Sweden, and Murat's services were declined by the emperor. MacDonald, Perignon, Marmont, and Victor stayed loyal to the Bourbons. Oudinot and Augereau chose neither side and stayed at home. Thus, Napoleon needed some new blood in the marshalate. Grouchy had been a general of division for 20 years and was overjoyed at this unexpected promotion. In June 1815, Napoleon marched to Belgium to surprise the British under Wellington and the Prussians under Blücher. He assigned Ney to command one wing to attack the British and Napoleon himself to attack the Prussians at Ligny. Grouchy was given control of two divisions of infantry and one division of cavalry. Ligny was a solid victory for Napoleon over the Prussians. Napoleon's 67,000 troops routed Blücher's 83,000 soldiers, and they duly retreated. On the other wing, Marshal Ney inexplicably delayed his attack on the British at Quatre Bras, which allowed them to reinforce their position. The battle turned into a bloody stalemate as the French and British slugged it out over this vital crossroads. This failure on Ney's part to follow orders infuriated the emperor. The day after Napoleon's victory over the Prussians, Grouchy awaited orders and finally received them at 1 p.m. the next day. This in itself was unusual, as Napoleon usually dispatched his cavalry immediately after a retreating enemy to keep his sword at their back. Upon receiving his orders, Grouchy and his corps advanced to the town of Wavre, to pursue the Prussians under General Thielman. He was also ordered to prevent the Prussians from aiding Wellington's army. On the same day Napoleon and Wellington's cannons of Waterloo were firing, Marshal Grouchy and General Thielman were battling it out at Wavre. Grouchy's corps commanders pleaded with him to disengage with the Prussian army and return to assist the emperor. But this would have gone against the emperor's orders and having seen Marshal Ney's rebuke a day earlier, Grouchy chose to follow his orders to the letter and attack the Prussians in front of him. He couldn't have known that the Prussians he was facing was their rear guard, and that Blücher and a larger Prussian corps would be flanking Napoleon at that very moment. Marshal Soult, who was acting as Napoleon's chief of staff, had neglected to set up a courier line to keep in constant contact with Grouchy's corps. Historians and Monday morning quarterbacks blame Grouchy for not interposing his corps between Blücher and Napoleon. After the loss, Napoleon, who was not one to take blame for a loss, remarked on Grouchy, quote, his conduct was as unforeseeable as if his army on the march had undergone an earthquake and been swallowed up, end quote. The criticism of Grouchy not marching to the sound of guns is totally unfounded. His job was to march to Wavre and engage the Prussians he found there, which he did. He beat them in a smart action and then successfully withdrew his 33,000 men to Paris to fight another day. Unfortunately, Napoleon abdicated his throne for the second and final time, and diehard Bonapartists blame Grouchy to this very day. This accusation is ludicrous on a number of fronts, but chiefly among them, even if Napoleon had won at Waterloo, he was still facing a strongly united 7th coalition of 800,000 troops. At best, Napoleon had 280,000 soldiers, so the sheer weight of numbers would have eventually worn down the French army. Yes, Napoleon fought and won at long odds before, but that was against three or four countries united against him. In the Seventh Coalition, it was basically every country in Europe against him, and there weren't going to be any fractures in their alliance this time. France had been at war for over 20 years, and their resources, both men and material, were at their limits. Other critics of Grouchy point out that a cavalry leader 
shouldn't have been left in charge of an independent corps in the 1815 Waterloo campaign. This is utter nonsense, as Grouchy started his career in artillery, worked his way up in cavalry, and handled infantry divisions throughout his career. As historian and author Paul Dawson states, quote, Despite what many historians suggest, Grouchy acquitted himself marvelously during the campaign. He was an excellent administrator, and the truth of the matter is, he was an excellent choice to command the right wing of Napoleon's army. His retreat to Paris is a textbook fighting retreat, yet few remember him for this. End quote. Following King Louis' return to the throne, Grouchy's name was added to the prescribed list of treasonous officers, so he wisely hopped on a boat to the United States and arrived in Baltimore, Maryland in January of 1816. He later bought a house in Philadelphia and spent time with other exiles, including Napoleon's brother Joseph. In 1819, Grouchy received amnesty from the French royal government. He returned in 1820 and was reinstated as a general in the army. It would be another decade before King Louis-Philippe restored his marshal's rank in 1830. Grouchy attended the funeral of Napoleon in 1840 and spent the remainder of his life defending his actions at Waterloo. Grouchy's wife, Cecile, died in 1827. The marshal remarried a few months later to Josephine Fanny, the marshal was 61, and she was 25. The couple had one daughter. Josephine stayed married to the marshal until his death in 1847, and she eventually passed in 1889. Marshal Grouchy had a battle record of six wins and three losses. He served France gloriously, and his memory should only be shown respect by all. I think we'll end on this point. Join us next time when we learn about Marshal Bessier, possibly the most loyal of Napoleon's marshals. As Napoleon remarked, quote, Bessier had a cold sort of bravery and was calm amidst the fighting. He had very good eyes and was very experienced at cavalry maneuvers, best suited to commanding cavalry reserves. Bessier was a vigorous reserve officer, but prudent and circumspect. He was to be seen in all the great battles, performing the greatest of services. End quote. Thanks for joining us.